Ha leya betu washte yu ha ye mitaki api Emily White Hat imachi api naha la ko chaje ki na pe washte wi imachi api yu ha chate washte na pe chuja chuzapi naha si changu la kota naha ashke gulipi eta wa uk sto. Hello everyone, my name is Emily White Hat. I am the Vice President of Programs and I greet you all with a good heart and a handshake today. I um, am a citizen of the Sichangu Lakota Nation and I am I come from the Ashke Gulipi Tioshwe, which means we wrap our hair in defiance. As I mentioned, I'm the Vice President of Programs at the American Indian College Fund and I thank you for taking the time to join us today. <clears throat> with COVID-19 public outcry, about the deaths of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmaud Arbery, and many others, juxtaposed with the upcoming census in our national elections, Native America stands at a crossroads. We are seeing a change in public sentiment on the mascot issue and case law in the Supreme Court with the recent McGirt versus Oklahoma decision. The American Indian College Fund saw an opportunity for Native students and youth to create greater visibility of our communities create equity for our people and reinforce our tribal sovereignty. With that in mind, we reached out to activists and leaders in the indigenous community <clears throat> to create the Free American Indian College Fund Acti Indigenous Activism Speaker Series. Today's webinar is the last in seven webinars that we have hosted to discuss issues facing native people and to provide ways that you can advocate for our communities. If you missed the previous webinar, you can still watch those webinars. They're on our website at collegefund.org backslash advocacy backslash indigenous dash activism backslash. We'll also put that in the chat box. <clears throat> now on to our program. I'm really excited today to be able to host and to introduce my friend, Crystal Echohad, who will share today's webinar topic, why native representation matters and mascots matter. Crystal has done some tremendous work over time. I'm going to do a brief uh, intro of her. Crystal, it's good to see you. Crystal Echohag is a citizen of the Pawnee Nation, a passionate advocate for the rights of Native peoples, and has worked in social justice, philanthropy, and as an entrepreneur. In 2018, she was recognized by the National Center for American Indian Economic Development as Native American Woman Business Leader of the Year, Business Owner of the Year. Christo and her company, Echohawk Consulting, designed and co-led Reclaiming Native Truths, a $3.3 million project in 2016 to 2018. This project was the largest public opinion research initiative ever conducted about Native Americans. It mapped the dominant narratives and invisibility that negatively impact Native peoples at every level of society. In 2018, Christo founded Illuminative, a nonprofit racial and social justice organization to translate the formation or the formative research of reclaiming native truth into action. Illuminative, Illuminative's mission is to amplify contemporary native voices, stories and issues to build power for native people to advocate justice, equity and self-determination. Its work is informed by unprecedented research that shows that the profound invisibility of Native peoples in contemporary society, coupled with the toxic misconceptions perpetuated by pop culture, media, and K-12 education fuels bias and racism against Native Americans. It is imperative that we transform how America and key institutions think about and engage with Native peoples in our fight with in order to fight systemic racism and achieve transformative change in Native communities for future generations. Illuminative uses research, narrative and culture change strategies to disrupt and interrupt invisibility and toxic misperceptions, to educate and to move hearts and minds with diverse sectors of American society about Native peoples and issues central to advancing justice and equity. Crystal received her master's degree in social and political thought and a bachelor's degree in European history from the University of Sussex at Palmer, England. You can find Crystal on Twitter at Crystal Echoha and on the web at www.illuminatives.org. And now please welcome Crystal Echoha. Hi, Crystal. Hi, Emily. Thank you so much for having me. 
Thank you so much, Emily. It's just so good to be here with you all. And I just really am uh, grateful for the invitation to be in this circle today for a really timely and important conversation and just uh, grateful to the College Fund and, and also want to give a special shout out to the the CEO of the American Indian College Fund, Cheryl Crazy Bull, who's also a, just a really valued um, member of our board of advisors um, here at Illuminative and just have been an exceptional mentor um, and part of the research and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about. Um, so thank you. Um, so I think maybe let's just go ahead and, and jump into it. Um, you know, I first want to acknowledge, you know, I'm coming to you today from um, Salina, Kansas, I'm, <laughs> where my daughter and I are actually driving back to Colorado to go visit family this weekend in a safe, socially distanced way. Um, so, um, but I'm coming to you from the traditional homelands of, of our Pawnee people here, um, as well as the Osage Ka and, and Comanche people, who's also, these are our, our ancestral lands. Um, so I think it's always important to ground ourselves in that. You know, so before I kind of jump in and, and I'm going to talk to you about some, the power of research and, and, and data um, and how that connects into the recent, you know, fight and victories for, for mascots. Um, but I, I also just really want to, you know, as we're talking about indigenous activism, right, I think it's really important to kind of talk about a little bit of the creation story um, behind this work and also just, you know, what brought me to, um, to this, to, to be engaged in, in activism, to be engaged in organizing um, for, you know, not only for my Pawnee people, but, you know, for in within an Indian country. And I think that really is centered, you know, so much in my family, um, you know, and, and the way that I was brought up. And I'm really grateful to, you know, my, my ancestors, my relatives, my aunties and uncles who really, you know, helped put me on this path and my, my dad in particular. Um, but also, you know, I come to this work, you know, as a, as a Pawnee woman, but most of all, I think what inspires me um, is my, is that I'm a mother, um, you know, and I think that has always really been the undercurrent for my work and really thinking about not only my daughter, right, but my, you know, my future grandchildren, right, and thinking about my, my nieces and nephews and my little relatives yet to come. Um, and thinking about all our, our, our native peoples across Indian country and these, these new generations and wanting to be a part of, of building a better world for them, right? And, you know, and taking up that responsibility and also just always understanding that we stand on the shoulders of those before us, right? As we come into this work and it's really coming into this circle and coming into this work with a lot of humility, knowing um, that we stand on the shoulders of our, our ancestors um, and our elders. And so, um, Carrie, you can go ahead and advance to the next slide. Um, what really, you know, first brought us, you know, what was kind of a big catalyst around our work here at Illuminative was a project called the Reclaiming Native Truth Project. And it was the largest um, research project ever done about what are the perceptions around Native peoples. It was a $3.3 million project that I uh, founded and co-led from 2016 to 2018. Um, and you know, as you can see here, this was, it was extensive, the kind of research um, that we were able to do to really go out and map what do Americans think about Native peoples and why do they think that, you know, where do those perceptions and what they think they know, where does, where does that come from and how do those perceptions show up and how do, how do they impact us as a Native peoples and what are the different ways they impact us. And we knew going in, right, as being Native people, we, we know our experiences as Native peoples, right, both in our own personal lives and families, but also in our professional selves, right, as we show up in a lot of different ways and oftentimes where we feel really unheard and, and, and invisible. Um, and, you know, and that we also feel we experience racism. Uh, we experience all kinds of, you know, from blatant racism to really, you know, kind of different types of microaggressions and things that, you know, our children and students sometimes face in schools and just other parts. So we knew that, but we knew we needed data. We knew we needed research to really begin to understand what, what was going on and why, or why do we always have to constantly explain ourselves or do, you know, what we call Indian 101. <laughs> why is that? Um, why do people still ask us, you know, in the 21st century if we live in teepees? Um, you know, all of those things that drive us crazy. And so really through this research, we were able to really start to get at a lot of those questions and start to under, unpack that and understand why. And, and, and we also began to really understand why 
more than ever things like mascots and eradicating mascots is really important for our people and the representation of our people. And I'm going to, I'm going to get into that more. Um, but um, I want, if we can advance to the next slide. So really one of the top, I mean, the top finding of our research, um, which was really, you know, I credit, um, you know, Dr. Stephanie Freiberg and Dr. Ariane Ethan um, and their research team for the work they did, um, you know, uh, around this. But what the top finding was of all that research we did extensively was that Native peoples are effectively invisible to the American public. We are out of sight, out of mind, and a lot of people don't know if, aren't even entirely sure um, if we still exist, especially if they're not living in proximity to a reservation. And so we really began to, it was pretty profound what we learned. Next slide. And so what we found is that this erasure is really systemic. Right, it's we're talking about big systems that are really perpetuating in our erasure, and one of the the greatest culprits of that is actually the K through 12 education system in particular. Um, and we found, you know, through research that had been done just prior to um, proclaiming Native Truth, that um, by uh, Professor Sarah Shear, that nearly 90% of schools in this country do not teach about Native peoples past 1900. Um, and that's really shocking, especially when you look at those 27 states that don't even make mention. Uh, and when, when you really think about that for a moment and think about literally generation after generation of Americans come through the K through 12 education system, millions, literally they're, the last thing that they typically hear about Native peoples is, might be Wounded Knee in 1890, right? And that after that, they don't learn anything about us as contemporary people through the 20th and now 21st century, you know, like students are not learning about tribal sovereignty in their government classes, right? When they learn about different, our, our forms of government in this country. Um, and so that is a really powerful erasure. And then we know what little does exist in the history books is nine times out of 10, highly inaccurate. And certainly those history books are not written by native peoples. They're not through our perspectives. They're not capturing the complexity of who we are or that we, comprise more than 600, you know, nations with different languages, forms of governments, you know, our spiritual and cultural life ways, the diversity of that, that, that is being erased um, in the K through 12 education system. Next slide. And what we also learned when we talk about big systems is that popular, popular culture and media are also really big culprits of the, in, within the erasure of native peoples. And so you can see sort of this stunning um, you know, piece of research that found that nearly 95% or 95% of images, when you type in Native American into Google, those are gonna come up as you know, dominant images being before 1900 and typically of only Native men before 1900, right? So you, that's a sort of the double erasure of, of, of Native women, uh, right? But that's really stunning when you think about the amount of data, right, that exists in the world that, that Google pulls in um, that you see that that result. Um, on the other side, we look at you know popular culture and entertainment, right? So t looking at TV and film, um, and especially now, I mean, really think about this. But this perspective is you know with COVID, everybody was sort of like glued to Netflix and watching all kinds of content right now, more than ever. But then you see that our representation in TV and film is less than 0.04 um, percent. Right, and that's pretty stunning. Um, we are like the lowest of the low in terms of representation, even though we make up over, you know, two percent of the entire population in this country. Um, but yet, we only represent zero point four percent of all representation in these mediums. So that's that's really powerful. And then when you what we when we kind of drilled into well, what is what's showing up in that zero point four percent of representation? It's really typically it's again pre nineteen hundred stories about us. And it's often really perpetuating really harmful stereotypes and tropes about us being savages or the mystical magical Indian or um, that we're, we're alcoholics, right? Or oftentimes we, you know, in some of that representation, we see our native women being brutalized um, as well. Um, and so that, that sliver of representation is not positive. Next slide. And so what happens when we think about these big systems of education, you know, media, you know, pop culture, right, erasing us, 
what results in this is what we found as we went out and did big gigantic national polls of over 2,000 people is that nearly 80% of Americans know little to nothing about us at all, right? And again, for people who aren't living in any sort of proximity to a native community, they're not even sure if we exist anymore because they don't see us. And you can see with that 72% that people rarely or never encounter information about us. So you start to kind of see the correlation of, you know, the erasure we see in these big systems and then how it shows up in people's lives that they're saying that they're not seeing anything about us. And so what we really found as we began to get in and unpack the research and do the analysis is that invisibility fuels bias against native peoples. It fuels what we call implicit bias. So sometimes an unconscious bias where people just, because they don't see us or hear about us, they don't think about us, right? So then that's why we often, more often than not get excluded from all kinds of conversations and things that we should be a part of. Right. And it also, in, in a sense, ends up fueling explicit bias. Right. But we see how this bias really begins to show up in, in our schools, in the media, in the courts and Congress. And it really prevents us from having a seat at the table. But what that invisibility also does is it really dehumanizes us as Native peoples. And when, when we are stripped of our humanity, right, when we are dehumanized in this way, that really opens the door for racism and violence and all kinds of harm against our peoples. Next slide. And so again, this just really accentuates this point that as we begin to understand, especially as we kind of see things happening in our lives or the way people act towards us or one particular institution, it's understanding. We need to look up and understand that this is a larger, larger systems issue. So if when we think about how we make change, right, we have to understand as we chart strategy and we think about this, we have to think about how we have to make changes and everything from our government and elected officials and how they look at us from the courts and the Congress and all the way down the line into our local governments, um, to the K through 12 education system, to media and entertainment. We've got to really be looking at strategies for change. Next slide. And so what we found is that, you know, invisibility is really the modern form of racism against Native peoples. And this is why it's so important that we really work to disrupt and interrupt, you know, that invisibility. And what that means is that we've really got to prioritize our representation as Native peoples. And it can't just be any representation. It has to be quality, accurate, authentic, contemporary representation that is authored by us and with our consent for us. Next slide. And so the other flip side of invisibility is that it really creates a void, right? A void of representation that gets filled by non-native people with a lot of, you know, myths and false narratives, these toxic stereotypes, um, that that's the only thing when people don't see us anywhere else, but they see these little slivers of, of this kind of toxic representation not authored by us, that is what shapes their perceptions. That's what shapes what they think about us as native peoples. And it also shapes an end how they treat us and how policies get formulated about us. All these things, they inform how the brain works, right? And how people perceive and the way that they act in, in, in this world. And it has a really big impact on us. Next slide. And so this is where we get to racist sports mascots. And so this is one of the few slivers of representation that makes it into the popular consciousness of the American public. And so, you know, we see like, for example, we kicked off 2020, which has been a horrible year so far, with the Super Bowl in February with the Kansas City Chiefs being in the Super Bowl. And so when you think about, you know, the viewership of like a billion people who end up participating, you know, and watching in, in, in the Super Bowl and all the kind of spectacle around it, right, you realize that red face, right? Red face was on display, right? And, and people wearing turkey feathers and these headdresses, the, the uh, Kansas City chop, the, the chants, all of this stuff, the way that, you know, fans are dressing up and, and like, and playing Indian, right? That was on display. And that was basically the American, you know, it was the NFL, the Kansas City Chiefs, and really the, all the institutions and media around it saying that this kind of racism is okay right and we need to understand that 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 red face is black face and in this country black face has become you know something that i think increasingly people understand that is a no go right people have lost their jobs in a nanosecond right when they've been linked to being you know practicing black face right we've seen that happen quite a bit over the last couple of years but yet 
red faced is okay and playing Indian and cultural appropriation. And despite the fact that native peoples for decades has said that this is harmful, it's offensive, we don't want it. it the NFL and, and so many sports teams still plow through with this, right? And what we have found through research is that this, this kind of representation is really, really harmful for us as, as native peoples. And, you know, again, I really, um, I credit, you know, um, I mean, they don't credit, it's a fact, like Dr. Stephanie Freiberg, right? Um, if you don't know who she is, look her up. She's Tulalip, she's now at the University of Michigan for more than a decade, has really worked on research to really understand um, and go out with using science, using research to understand what is the impact that mascots have on our people. And, you know, and not, not like public opinion, we're really talking about what does this do to our people? And she did really important research um, starting, you know, over the last decade, looking at, well, how do these, these images that you have in front of you right now, how do they affect our native children and youth, right? And what she found when our children are exposed to this type of Im imagery, right? And it's not just the, the logo that you see on the Washington football team helmet there, right? It's also the dictionary defined slur that was that team name, right? It's, but it's the fan behavior that goes all around the, like a mascot name. So it's not just always the name, not just the logo, it's really the whole kind of ecosystem that goes around and around fan behavior. That when our children are exposed to that, it increases anxiety, it increases depression, it increases suicidal ideation. And when they looked at, you know, college students, right, they also found that that really depressed our young Native adults' ability to see a future for themselves. And again, it, it, it really um, decreased self-esteem. And so it causes harm. That's the headline here. And you will hear any time over the last, you know, several years that when this mascot debate comes up, there's a famous Washington Post poll that says, oh no, wait a minute, we went out and asked Native Americans and 90% of them said we don't have an issue with Native people or with mascots or the Washington team name. Um, and so many Native people and a lot of really amazing Native scholars and just national organizations and Native activists pushed back and said, who are these Native people you're talking to? They pulled like 500 of self-identified people and, and there was just so many issues with the methodology and saying there's no way that 90% of Native people, right, think that this is okay. Um, the numbers have got to be closer. And in fact, Dr. Freiberg went back out um, with Dr. Eason last year and did a, a survey and found that actually more than 50% of Native people are opposed to it. And people um, ages you know, 18 to uh, 30, 68% um, are opposed to mascots and the Washington team name. And so, and that was with, they went out and surveyed 1,100 Native peoples from all across the country in reservations and urban settings and really did it well. And I encourage you, you can go onto our website and learn more about that study. But I think the important thing that Dr. Freiberg brought up is that we're having, when, when it gets put out there about public opinion, Right, and you kind of oftentimes see teams coming forward saying, "Oh, but I this I've talked to this native person over here, and they're totally fine with it." So therefore, it sort of rationalizes and justifies why it's okay, right? Um, that we're having the wrong conversation, right? And this is really where Dr. Freiberg and so many people are coming from is that we need to change the conversation about this is about harm. This is about harm to our children, our native children, and we we value all children. All children deserve to be safe, to be healthy, to not have to have, you know, things that create, you know, harm to them and, and create, you know, um, depression and all kinds of stuff, right? Our children are deserved to be celebrated and honored and loved and not to made to be feel this way. And this is what mascots do to them. They cause real psychological harm. So we need to change the conversation. And so I bring all this up because when we talk about activism, right, we often think about taking to the streets, right? We think about all these different manifestations, especially right now, around how we're making our voices heard. But one thing, I my big message to all of you as, as current indigenous activists, future indigenous activists, is that data, especially with native people, because we are so invisible in society, data is one of our, 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 our great weapons, right? It's, it's really an arrow for us. It's, a, it, it's part of our arsenal of how we go out and organize and how we fight and how we make our voices heard and data is really powerful. Scientific data and numbers is really powerful in combination with a lot of other things. And so I wanna now just kind of open it up or uh, turn, go into our next slide where I wanna take us through a really quick case study of how the Washington football team name change happened. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> 
And so, you know, I give you this precursor about the data. I wanted to set the table in which, you know, about how people see native peoples and all of that to now then come into setting the table and how we understand how this happened. And it was really because of a perfect storm. And I think as we looked at media coverage and the conversation around it, for so many people, this was like a new fight, right? To the average, probably non-native out there. But what people don't understand is that this is 30 plus years of organizing by native leaders like Suzanne Harjo, and more recently, Amanda Blackhorse, um, and just thousands of other native peoples, right? Who for generations have been really fighting on this issue around the mascots and the Washington football team name, right? And not only that, but when we know the R word, you know, has shown up for in, in K through 12 schools as well. There has been so much organizing, right? That pre pre <laughs> that led up to this moment this summer, right? So that's point number one. Point number two, and I just covered it, was this more than a decade worth of research by Dr. Stephanie Freiberg and other native and non-native scholars, right? Who've really looked into this issue, right? They've really been building the science and the evidence about why mascots are harmful. And some of that, you know, um, evidence has gone to be straight to Congress, right? Where Dr. Freiberg has been able to testify about the harm of things like this. But then in this moment, the catalytic moment, and it's so unfortunate, it, it, it was the murder of George Floyd, right? Um, and Ahmaud Arbery and Breonna Taylor in this moment of reckoning, a national reckoning and people taking him to the street and this reckoning with systemic racism. And, you know, in starting out with a conversation about police violence, right, in the criminal justice system, but then it, it really expanded to really be this larger conversation about systemic racism and the way that it manifests all it, in all different ways. And if you recall and think about the timeline this summer is that very quickly, right, as people began to really talk about systemic racism, all of a sudden you had all these big brands jump up, right, like Aunt Jemima, right, um, um, and, and even Eskimo Pies, right, like all of a sudden you just started seeing all these things start to fall where big corporations were saying, you know what, we're hearing people and we are going to start to eliminate racialized imagery. Right, so that really began to tee this up because soon after those big companies started saying, we're gonna eliminate these racialized imagery that we have as part of our brands. One of the big questions that started coming up over and over is one of the biggest racialized racist brands in this country is the Washington football team name and their name, which is a dictionary defined racial slur. And people started going at it. And then if you remember Blackout Tuesday, right, where everyone was asked to well, wasn't necessarily asked, it ended up being a big controversy, but everyone moved to kind of put a black square up and make a statement about what was happening. And the Washington football team did that, right? And said, we're against systemic racism. And you had Roger Goodell come out and make all these big, you know, comments about how, you know, they, the NFL was opposed to racism and sort of apologized to Colin Kaepernick, right? But then people called out the Washington football team name, and it was really AOC who, one tweet that said, if you're against racism, then eliminate the Washington football team name. And Congresswoman Deb Holland also put out a tweet saying, saying something equally, if not more powerful. And what that did was set out a viral chain reaction on social media. And that's really important to understand how all these different chains of events came together. And so really for Illuminative, right, we are all about using digital organizing as a tactic, right, about how we engage in narrative change, right, how we really fight this, these levels of harmful representation. And so we really began to jump in here and start to do some pretty serious digital organizing. We also joined forces with First Peoples Worldwide who had been working with an investor table of, of people who are shareholders in major corporations who've actually been working also for more than a decade right around trying to get the Washington team name change. And they organized $620 billion worth of investors in big companies like Nike and Bank of America, right? And other major sponsors of the NFL and the Washington team, right? To basically say, you need to change the name and we join forces with them. And joining forces with them, we also really join forces to come up with a, a collaborative media strategy where we started hammering, right? All the major media outlets and working on social media and media. And then we also really connected, right, with looking at the power of economics, right, about creating that pressure under corporations. And then yes, the grassroots mobilization is the power that fuels all of this. So I think it's really important as we, we look at all of these things that came together to kind of take this big giant down, it was a perfect storm.
that's been building over time with a lot of different people. Next slide. And so this is this was the one graphic that we put out there, right? And we we called our our campaign the time is now. And I'm not saying illuminative was the reason why, right? We're one of the many kind of people that got out there and organized, but this was the one visual graphic. So we know social media is a powerful organizing tool, especially now in the time of COVID, right? And how important it is when we think about using art, right? Um, and visual stuff to really, art and culture can kind of open up a different kind of conversation. And this, this got millions and millions of share and really, and we didn't put you see there's no logos on here. It was unbranded because it was really like this movement belongs to everyone, right? All of this. And it was a way that we were really able to engage and activate a lot of people that created a huge social groundswell. Next slide. This was another one. And this really, again, the investor strategy, you know, First Peoples Worldwide was the point person working with those $620 billion worth of investors. And they sent letters to the CEOs of those big companies like Nike that were major, major sponsors of the NFL and the Washington football team name, basically saying, you know, this is your, this is your shareholders telling you that you need to do the right thing and you need to get rid of this team name now and you need to eliminate the imagery, right? And so it was that pressure that those investors started putting on those CEOs and the boards of directors of those, right? And also who then in start turn giving calls to Roger Goodell saying we're getting worried because we're starting to see the social groundswell, right? So it was the power of those investors, but then it was also making it very open and public and really generating this huge pressure. And if you remember right before the Washington team announced that they were going to do their name change. Nike pulled all of the Washington football team gear off of their website, right? And you started seeing Bank of America saying, you got to change the name, right? And they're the ones with all the kind of, you know, and FedEx, right? FedEx is CEO who has the naming rights of the stadium. Just all of a sudden, they really started to panic. And there were a lot of panic calls going to Roger Goodell and to Dan Snyder, the owner. Of, of the team and some of the minority owners said, you know what, we're backing away. Like we, we want out, we want the name to change, things need to happen. But it was again, the investor strategy really coming into line with the digital organizing and the power of the grassroots, um, not only within Indian country, but also with allies. Next slide. And so these are some of the kind of highlights and turning points in the victory, right? And just as we kind of just, and I'm speaking here very specifically to the kind of digital organizing, social groundswell strategy. And so within one week of the time, launch of the, the time is now um, social strategy, right? And when we joined forces with, with the investors, we were able to really all work in partnership and with Suzanne Harjo and Amanda Blackhorse and all these other people who had already been organizing. We were all on the phone coordinating. And I think that's really important when we think about activism. It's never one individual. It's not one organization that gets big social change done. It's really important that in Indian country, we, we work together, right? We really form important collaborations and, and with different organizations and grassroots organizations and really come together to coordinate. And that's how when we work together, we have so much power as a collective, right? And when we can work in concert and get our allies to work in concert with us and follow our lead. And so you can see we were through all of this coordination that was happening behind the scenes, Right, but illuminative, our kind of role was the point person on, on, you know, on some of the social stuff with the art, but also engaging big influencers like Taika Waititi and Ava DuVernay and Congresswoman Holland and others, right, to really get out there on social, not only share those graphics, but help start the conversation with people that follow them and to get to really recruit their followers um, and people that they work with to really join the fight. And so you can see all together through all of this level of coordination across all these different organizations and different activists and allies that we were able to generate over 46 million social media impressions, right? We had coverage in 38 major media outlets with some of the biggest ones covering, which is huge when you think about typically our erasure, right? And how this social groundswell, all of us working together really forced the media to start to pay attention and really start in this conversation and we learned the power of this also, right, when we think back to Standing Rock, right? And when we all came together at Standing Rock, whether you were in that camp or you were on social media, you were calling politicians, you were doing all calling your media outlets. When we generate, when we work together to create that social groundswell, we force these things like media to pay attention to us and to really amplify our voices and hear our stories. And so that's a really important point when we think about 
our activism and, and how we start to kind of um, accelerate change. Next slide. And so, you know, when we look at, um, you know, kind of our, our research around, you know, going back into the research, right? It was also being able to use that research as part of, you know, kind of our, our arrows, right? Our weapons, you know, and, and, and to really look at that every time the Washington franchise tried to come back with some kind of point, right? Or the NFL or kind of all the people around it, or, you know, here are a lot of sort of, sort of these racist comments about us being oversensitive or being snowflakes, right? We were able to really use the research to say, no, we're changing the conversation or don't bring up the Washington Post poll, that faulty poll because we're changing the conversation. This isn't about public opinion. This isn't about voting whether we think racism is right or wrong, right? This is really about changing the conversation about the psychological harm that causes to our children and people. And so we were able to really use that research as effective tool as we were out there making our arguments in the way that other, in, in putting the research out there, it empowered lots of different voices to make those arguments from a lot of different sides. Um, and so when you look at in less than four weeks through the rapid response organizing, the strategic communications, working with these influencers and different movement leaders together, right, not just illuminative, right, but together we were able to achieve over 73 million media impressions and 42 media impressions through just the, the media coverage across the world. That is massive, right? That is massive, but that again, that's not one organization that's all of us working in concert together and that's the power of movement building right and when we coordinate when we come together and when we organize together that's the power of our collective change next slide so this is where we really open up it's like what's next right and the braves right now you know they announced shortly i think it was on the monday after the Washington football team team um, announcement on their name change that they were taking their name under review and they are doing they're in process right now we're really hopeful <laughs> right that they're going to do the right thing and we're we're hearing that that it is going to come right um uh not the Braves sorry the the Cleveland Indians um and you know the Braves have said come out and said they're not going to change their name right and that's that's a whole problem and that's a conversation to be had but the the they're putting the tomahawk chop under review right and they've started working very closely in partnership with the Eastern Band Cherokee and other native leaders to think about what is what is the right changes to make. Um, Kansas City, right, where we know that there's some internal conversations happening there and they recently came out with an announcement saying they're gonna ban red face and the headdresses and that kind of fan behavior, but they have, well, they have not gone so far to entertain name change and they're still keeping you know, the chop for now, right? And so that's a problem, right? And the Blackhawks have also come out and said that they're not, they're not going to make name change. So there's still a lot to do. And we can't forget that there's still, you know, more than, you know, a thousand or more schools that still have native mascots, K through 12 schools. And we also look at collegiate sports as well. So there's still a lot of work to do. But we need to note that more than 2000 schools already in the country have made the change, right? So there is momentum happening. So I think this is where, you know, we really, I want to open up the conversation, you know, and really think about what's next, right? Not only with what's happening with these big professional sports teams name, but how do we make change in, in our, our personal communities, right? And the institutions um, and communities in which we're living in. And so, um, yeah, Emily, I'd, I'd love to open up that, that conversation with you and everybody that's, that's joining us today in this circle. Thank you, Crystal. I just always appreciate uh, hearing you present the findings uh, and the work that you're doing because you're right, it's, it really is a movement that um, has been created and some tre tremendous research, um, which is what we need. And I like the use of um, the arrows. Uh, data is one of our arrows. That's always important. So um, I'm going to start with a couple questions and then I have a couple other things that I, I was thinking about as we were uh, talking that we might want to touch base on if we have some time. So. One of the questions was, how do you address people in power who say updated images for native mascots are honorable, such as a feather, but I still identify as a, a mascot as an Indian? I'm sorry, can you repeat that again so my audio yeah, cut out for just a second? That's fine. How do you address people in power who say updated in images for native mascots are honorable, such as a feather, but still identify a mascot as an Indian? You know, I think it's just saying, you know, I think it's, it's, there's a, there's a bigger conversation. One, it's always about, 
free, you know, informed and prior consent, right, for Native people. And I think we're constantly in being put in this position by non-Native people in positions of power. They treat us like children, like we don't know our own minds, right? So they're telling us, oh, no, 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 it doesn't matter. This is honorable now. We're telling you that this is okay. And it's not representation 99.9% .9 of the time that we are originating, right? If you want to honor Native people, like we can talk about all kinds of cool ways that you can honor native people, but it doesn't mean that you dehumanize us and you, you objectify us. Right. So we get to decide what's honorable. Right. And I think that that's really important. And it's, it's one of these things constantly where they just, they want to circumvent us as native peoples, as tribal nations, as communities, and we can't allow that anymore. Right. And I think that we need to really understand, I mean, we, our position is that eliminating all native mascots is important. We just don't think it has any place in sports because it doesn't even just like, when you look at a feather, right? Like to your point, um, you think, well, that doesn't look bad. But what that does is that opens the door for that, that fan behavior, right? Mm -hmm. And that's the important thing. That's why I was saying, it's not always just the name or just the imagery, it's, it's how it opens the door for all of the horrible fan behavior. And also not only of the fans of the team, but it's the rival fans, right? And so there was a study done right after, uh, right after the Super Bowl, right? Because you remember it was the Kansas City Chiefs who were against the, the San Francisco 49ers. And the level of hate speech from San Francisco 49ers, right? It ended up being hate speech. It was really, you know, those fans will look at it like we're just talking smack about the Kansas City team, right? And their fans, but they kept kind of saying things like massacre the Indians, right? And all this just horrible kind of stuff that comes out with it. And so that's why we've really taken the position along with, with, with scholars like Stephanie Freiberg and others that we need to really eliminate all of that. Right now, I think there's a, a longer term conversation that I think we need to have in Indian country about, well, are we, is there any kind of imagery and representation that is, is good? I think we need to be having conversations, right? But we need to be kind of taking all these factors in and, but we need to be driving that conversation and not letting non-native power holders drive it for us. Thank you. Um, a, a couple of questions that have come in are regarding what about our tribal communities and local, mm -hmm. like tribal public schools using uh, names that um, we might deem as mascot names. Yeah, and you know, I have to say first and foremost, I, I have so much respect for tribal sovereignty, right? And for, for native communities and if native communities have, have given consent, right? <laughs> they have pre-informed prior consent, right? They've been a part of that process. I mean, I respect that. But, you know, I often liken, um, you know, I think for a long time in this country, everybody thought uh, smoking cigarettes was really good for you, right? Your doctors even smoked, right? You know, in, in the doctor's office, right? And it was just, it was a norm, right? And then lo and behold, science came out and said, this is really harmful. This will kill you. This causes cancer, right? And all of this harm. And it was like, oh, I mean, we might really like it, <laughs> right? We think that's cool um, or whatever those different factors. But once we actually understand the science and we start to understand that it causes harm. And so the one thing I would ask in a really respectful and a good way, right, to our tribal nations, right, and to our tribal schools and the leaders of our tribal schools is read the research. Read about the effects that it has on children, right? And think about, even though it might be a source of pride in tribal schools, think about what happens when you go out and play rival teams. And I think about one of our teams back home in Oklahoma, right up at Oto and, uh, uh, you know, Frontier Schools. And, and I think that, you know, they're the Indians, right? And it's this, I mean, they're a powerhouse native girls basketball team. I mean, they are always making it like into the finals. But I just, my heart breaks when I see the videos coming in from the games and seeing some of those teams that come in with kill the Indians and just, they're yelling really racist stuff. And it's, it's about the atmosphere that it creates. And so I think those are the conversations that tribal schools administrators and tribal leaders need to be having. Like those are the unintended consequences, right? I think my other point would be that for so long in this country, we have been erased, right? We have been minimized, right? We have been discriminated against from the federal government down right and we and i that's why i showed all that rep, that research in the beginning about how our how profound our erasure is in this country and so it's i think it's backed us into a point where sometimes we think 
you know, we're often only given the choice by, by big companies and, and others that we only have two choices around our representation. Either we're invisible or we take what they give us, right? And sports mascots feels like it's one of those things that they take it. <laughs> and that's why I think sometimes we would rather have be seen that we'll go for that bad representation because we want, it's a normal human thing. We want to be seen. We want to be celebrated, right? We want to feel good. And when we see that, at least we feel like we're part of the society. But I think we're at this moment, especially in this moment in this country, that we need to demand more for ourselves and better for ourselves. We need to demand positive representation that is authored by us with our consent, right? That really respects us. You know, and I think that that's, that's really, really important that we, we, we reopen these conversations within our communities and with our tribal leadership in schools. Thank you. One of the things I was thinking about as well, um, as you were sharing, was thinking about the upcoming election, right? We know how critical, every election is critical, and our representation um, in, as Native people in the elections um, over history has shown a change um, in, in, uh, elected, in the elected representatives. So as we're thinking about that, um, there's a lot of focus because it's a presidential election, but why else should people be thinking about voting and how does that relate to the grassroots movement? Um, thinking about the conversation about the school district, right? Why is this election important to our local school districts in changing the mascot name, our representation? Yeah, that is such an important question, Emily. And, you know, right now, Illuminative is partnered up um, with the Native Organizers Alliance, and we launched um, our Natives Vote 2020 campaign. And, you know, as we've been out there really talking about people, um, talking to, you know, our Native people about the importance of registering to vote, verifying your registration, and actually getting out and voting, you know, we've heard from our, a lot of our folks that I'm just, I'm, I'm not feeling either candidate, right? We hear from a lot of our young people and I mean, just a lot of people are across our board. Like we don't, we don't trust the government. What has the government done for us, right? In fact, we did a recent uh, new study called the Indigenous Futures Survey. Um, we're gonna come out with the results in a few weeks, but we found that 96% of the six, over 6,400 native peoples we surveyed nationwide, <laughs> right? 96% of our native peoples do not trust the government, right? They don't trust institutions, right? And with good reason, right? Um, and so why vote, right? Why vote if you're not excited for a candidate? Why vote if you have a lot of distrust? But the thing is, is that we need to look at voting as a tactic. It's not, a, it's not the end all be all. What, what happens on November 3rd is not the end all be all, but that is one of our, another one of our arrows. I talked about research being an arrow. Governor Stephen Lewis from Gila River said this the other night, voting is also one of our arrows as well. And so we can't just be thinking about what's going on in the presidential race. We need to think about all the other races, right? From, from the congressional races to the state, you know, legislatures, but down to the, your local races about who's sitting on those school boards, right? If you have a racist sports mascot, you know, have in one of these schools that's, you know, not a, not a tribal school, right? In the public school system, who's sitting on those school boards? Right, and when you look at those types of things, or, or we're looking at those, you know, elect officials that end up overseeing law enforcement and education systems and different things, and who's appointing people in power in education, for example, right? Who's making these decisions? It's really important that we exercise our voice and our right to vote, because we need the right kinds of people in those positions so that they can hear us and that they can be a great ally and be a partner in the kind of change we need in order to fight racism, right? And to make the system systematic changes that we need to ensure not only our, our accurate representation, but that we're, we're really, we're part of the change that we all wanna see, right? That we're part of the change of quality education and that we're really, we're part of the change that no longer do our native children have to go to school and have to live in a hostile learning environment, an environment day in and day out. And that's why it's important to vote. It's not just at the top, they talk about down the ballot. Right, and that's where we need to make sure your voices are heard. As I think about um, changes in language and, and um, how things have been perceived in history over time, I think about uh, the Battle of Little Bighorn and the Wounded Knee Massacre, right? We, we grew up, the two of us, in a time period in schools where it was opposite. It was the, the Battle, um, the Little Bighorn Massacre and the Wounded Knee, um, the, the uh, Wounded Knee Battle. And so as we're thinking about um, 
the importance of not only visibility in our K through 12 education, as well as just through our college education. A couple of years ago, the American Indian College Fund issued a report um, called the uh, Creating Visibility in, um, in Higher Education for Indigenous Peoples. And we had eight declarations, and one of the declarations was to really bring visibility to your students within your education system. And this was specifically around higher ed, but we can think about how we would do it in early childhood education and you know, throughout the, the levels of education. Um, and we say at the American Indian College Fund, even if you have one Native student, you as the president of your university should know exactly who that Native student is. And so recently I participated about a year ago on an, on an equity round table. And I did bring up the importance of hearing the Native voice as well as recognizing the population. And in your presentation, you brought that there is, we're always considered like a small population. And one of the great findings from that report was about how call, the process of colonization led to that, right? And so it's even more important that we're not only focusing on the group because it's a smaller group, um, that it, it means that we need to put greater focus and attention on our population um, for that reason and knowledge. So just if you had any thoughts um, or encouragement for any educators that may be listening about how they can continue to be proactive and bring that, because I know in your research, you show how to start to turn different um, populations in bringing up a key point of like uh, of relative, I'm trying to think of the right word, of just bringing up more awareness and making it more human to them. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, we can't forget, I mean, I think, you know, I don't know how you all are feeling. I feel really um, overwhelmed <laughs> right now with everything that's happening right in the world. It's like every five minutes, right? And I think, and we, we can feel a lot of outrage at just the injustices, right? That have just even unfolded in the last 24 hours, right? And, and people taking to the streets. Um, but I think we also need to understand and stand in our power of the moment, right? In, in our collective power and what is happening, conversations and, and people are really looking at this issue around systemic racism, right? And, 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 and I think there's a lot of people really leaning in, non-Native people saying, wow, we, we didn't know. I mean, that's why things, books on white privilege and all kinds of things were like the best sellers all summer long. Like I, there's, there's, there's people that are thinking in key institutions about, we, we never thought about that, right? We didn't realize. Um, and I think there's a great opportunity in this moment um, for educator, for Native educators, right, to really take a look at these systems and think about and to start those conversations within their institutions and to start conversations in a good way with allies. And I think the biggest thing is that it is better to call in than call out. And I think that's the harmful thing, right? I mean, sometimes we just got to call out when we got to throw down. I mean, if it's really egregious, but we're so much more powerful when we call people into the circle. Right. And I really that's my big piece of advice is we're talking about indigenous activism. Right. Is that you get you you have more power when you call people in in a good way. And we're really centered in our values. And I think to call people in and when we found with this research. Right. This research is is part of your your it's one of your arrows. Right. But in a good way, we found over the last two years as we have done. I've lost count of how many presentations nationwide it's you know we've done in, in, all over the country to to major universities, to the heads of, of major Hollywood studios, right? To politicians, to all kinds of people and just regular everyday people. And I will tell you about eight times out of 10, people come up to me, non-natives afterwards and just said, I didn't know. I didn't know that our systems are perpetuating this. And oh my gosh, it makes me wanna go back and have this conversation within our own institution. So use the research, call people in, have these conversations, it's, use the opportunity, this is a crisis, what do they say, crisitunity, <laughs> right? Where with the, cri it's creating an opportunity to have, it's shifting and this is the time to, for us to really get organized in a good way and start facilitating these conversations and not just conversations, we want real change, right? We want real policies, we want real systems change. We also have the census looming, right? The deadline is next Wednesday um, yeah. right now. And so we also just wanna, be able to remind people about the importance of that. And I think it is, it's not only, only at that local level, but it is a state level representation level in Congress. Well, and I think, you know, again, we representation, our representation, our contemporary representation, right? That's how we build power, 
right? That's how we build power as Native peoples and not power to be used in a negative way. It's how we power for us to, to lead our own self-determination, right? Power to achieve justice for our people, power to achieve equity, right? And to have seats at the table that we should be having, right? There isn't an, an important issue in this country that Native people should not have a voice in, right? <clears throat> and so representation is everything from who's in office from your local, <laughs> from tribal government, right? All the way up, right? We need more native people um, in office, right? Representing us in a good way. But we also need good representation in popular culture and media because that is what informs the way people think about us and the way they treat us, right? And, and all kinds of other things. Um, and so we really, we also need to understand that, that that power around representation in all these different ways it comes from the change that we, we need to create, right? And it comes from organizing, right? And that is not just gonna be achieved at the ballot box on November 3rd, right? But like you said, census, right? Filling that out is how we build power for our people because we're saying we count, right? And that directly ties to the allocation of resources we get for really important federal programs, right? You know, so we have to look at when we have this conversation around na native representation, we have to really connect it. How are we building power? And there are multitudes of ways that we need to do that. And so I'm calling you all in relatives, right? Let's, let's exercise that power together and look at all these different ways that we're doing this over long term. And that's how we're going to achieve the kinds of changes that we, we want and need in our, in our home tribal communities to our urban Indian communities, right? Um, it's, it's really important. In the last uh, presidential election, I was still voting in my home tribal community. And um, I, I always, what was so exciting was seeing my relatives, right? Just, it's like you see your relatives at home at IHS or when you go vote, um, if you're not at a family or social gathering. But one of the things I'm always reminded of is I had a Lake She, one of my uncles who, who was 17 when Pearl Harbor was bombed. And he walked 11 miles to go enlist in the military in December. And they brought him back to my grandmother to sign the papers um, so that he could go off to war. And when he came home, it wasn't until years later, you know, he, he, he started voting, he was registered to vote. But it wasn't until years later that he realized that we had a choice of what party we could be um, affiliated with. Because at the time, people were told, if you are above the Mason-Dixon line in this country, so we're thinking about in the 40s and 50s, right? This is the party you are affiliated with. And so um, he did not realize till later in his life that he had that choice. And so I always think about that, that similar to speaking our, like if we're speaking any aspect of our native language on a daily basis, you know, we're, we're doing something revolutionary, which is taking that time to vote as well. Um, and making our voices heard. So I, I know that we'll all be thinking about that over the next few weeks as we carry that into the polls. But before we close, I just have one um, sort of question about what do you say to that community member who um, does have a border town close to their, their tribal nation lands that probably was once um, their tribal nation lands, right? It was within the exterior boundaries, who still uses the mascot names. Um, and they're thinking about how to make a change. Like, what are some recommendations that you would give to them to, uh, to start the process? Yeah, well, really quickly, you know, when we did our research, we found that, no surprise, if anyone living near one of those border towns, that that's where bias and racism is really intense right? We, we, that's what our research found, right? Those are really the hotbeds for that kind of bias. So I think that's why um, voting, getting involved in your school board, right? And making sure that you're getting people from your tribe voted onto those local school boards. I know um, a, a friend of mine who just got voted onto her Osage, to the school in her, you know, that is adjacent to the Osage reservation. And she said, it's been tough, but, it, but having that voice in that room, getting more of our people into those positions, of leadership, right? Using the research, right? Taking the emotion out of this. This isn't an argument about political correctness. This is about harming children. And it's really engaging in conversation and kind of when you think about organizing your campaigns, right? You know, as you, you have to organize, right? You gotta organize your community. But I think when we frame it, like don't all children matter? Don't all children deserve to not have to go to these schools and feel like they're being bullied and that they're in a hostile environment. We don't want any child to be harmed, right? You don't want your child harmed. We don't want ours either. And this is what mascots do. And just laying out what the science says 
is going to help to change that conversation, right? And it's really, as we're seeing, when we <clears throat> create pressure, different pressure points, right? And you have to do that analysis in your community about what are those different pressure points that might get your school board to move. Maybe it's starting to say, okay, school board, you're not going to do it, but we're going to go to all the local businesses in town. Or we're going to go to the churches or, you know, kind of think about who are those influencers in the broader community, right? That might to start help you create that pressure. Just like I showed in that kind of model of all the pressure points that came around the Washington football team. It wasn't just one. It was a number of things. What's the economics, right? What's that economic pressure point? right? What's the social, you know, pressure point, but it really comes down to what is our collective power to organize and to do it in a peaceful way, right? Nonviolent, peaceful way we organize, right? And we just, we, and we need to call them one and remember our ancestors, right? And, and we've achieved big victories this summer. We've got some momentum. So I just really, I wish you all well, please go to our website at www.illuminatives.org. We have a whole tab on the mascot campaign with where the research fact sheets are, the social media graphics, links to more information, you know, follow people like Amanda Blackhorse and Suzanne Harjo um, and so many others that are out there doing really important work on this issue. And let's just, let's get it done because it's really important for our children and our future. Well, we'll peel off for your time, Crystal. We really appreciate your time, your knowledge, and have a safe drive uh, today as you continue on your journey to Colorado. And thank you, thank everybody, for taking the time to, to hear this presentation today. Thank you.